Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to all over the world. Welcome in our headquarter in Bitterfeld, more or less in life. Uh, all the guys are here and will speak directly in front of you. Uh, my name is Christoph. I welcome you, uh, you in the name of Adcon to this uh, third online webinar for broilers. And I hope you all will enjoy it. Um, I want to tell you that we deactivated uh, the speaking form, you, so you only can text us messages. So after each session, we will do some questionnaires. And if you want to ask something or not, you can already do it uh, during the speaking. And then after this first speech, we will try to answer the most of your questions as possible. So. First, I want to welcome Ajit uh, yeah, uh, from COP. And I hand over the speech to him. Welcome, and please introduce yourself. Yeah. Good morning. Thank you, Christoph. You're welcome. Good morning, everybody. My name is Said Nayati. I've been since uh, 15 years with COP Germany as technical service manager. And thank you, companies Adcon and ILAS to invite me for this nice webinar. And I was asked to speak about biosecurity and hygiene in poultry house, broiler house, it doesn't matter, broiler uh, or breeder is the same almost. And I will try in a few minutes to tell something which we actually we need whole day, but I run through to my slides. And if you have any question, anytime you can write us and send us, I try to answer it if I can. Otherwise, you send us an email. Uh, so that's the technique. The first slide is, as you are aware of it, all the world, especially in Europe and Germany, is discussion about antibiotic reproduction of food, especially meat in chicken or po uh, poultry production is very important. Is getting more and more difficult and and the discussion starts with uh, the resistance of uh, antibiotic uh, antibiotics in human medicine. And, and the, if you watch TV or read newspapers or listen to radio, all other um, social media, you hear every day something about it. And it is a big demand and also pressure of uh, non-GMO groups or uh, consumer that they want to have antibiotic-free uh, food or production, and that, that uh, also push retailers to respond to, to this demand, and then we get as producer at the end of the chain this pressure, and we should, and today we produce almost antibiotic-free uh, products which we can offer. And for sure, we cannot do the business as usual as it was the last 30, 40 years. So, uh, previously, antib antibiotics gave us a safety blanket, a safe that we thought that is normal, that we use it, and it was uh, a guarantee for our production. But today, it is not possible to use it. We don't want to use it. And for that reason, we should improve and make our management and make it so efficiently as is possible. And for that, you need to do the jobs through the house from the beginning before the birds arrive till the end as good as possible. And that starts by cleaning between two flocks, downtime, biosecurity, and then goes on with preheating, brooding, uh, water quality and good control of environment, ventilation system, with for controlling of, uh, of uh, humidity, CO2, and temperature in the house. But we are going to speak about these three uh, first topics today. So, it is very important when the flock is finished and the birds are catched, and you have the house now for the cleaning and washing, that you have enough time to do the job. Sometimes it is not so easy, but it is important to speak for your supplier 
and uh, organization that you can't get enough time to do the job and this job uh, needs needs time and you should take after washing disinfection everything is finished at downtime it is actually biological uh, silence in the house that means you leave everything in the house after you are finished with disinfection close the doors switch off the light and leave it for a few days few uh, certain time and at that time a lot of uh, microorganisms which are left uh, they cannot survive so long time without host. It is very effective uh, time doing um, getting the house free of any germs. And for sure, it is not only cleaning and washing the walls, it is washing and cleaning all, also all equipment. And after that, you can take a sample of, of your house and of your equipment to ensure that you were good, you did a good job. If not, you should repeat at least disinfection again. At the end, I will show you some, some examples. And also very important uh, to control your drinking water, drinking water quality, and, and also install a good biosecurity system in your farm as far as it possible, or your house setup is possible. So, house preparing starts first with cleaning and washing and disinfection, downtime, as I mentioned, it is for me is really very important. Uh, my own uh, experience from the practice, and then preheating litter and uh, preheating of floor litter and air, put new litter and feed on paper and uh, flush water before the chicken arrive. That's a very important topics that we should with that point we can start in a new block with so low pressure of germs as possible. Today, in our modern business, in animal husbandry, chicken house or breeder house, hygiene is the very uh, necessary part of the management. And uh, we, should, we should concentrate us to this, that point during the flock is running because it prevent to get any disease or challenges in the house, which can uh, affect negatively their flock health. And uh, farmer, they do with cleaning and with, uh, with disinfection, a kind of combination of the methods we can reduce or eliminate the contamination. Okay, elimination, we cannot get house 100% free, but we can reduce the pressure of the germs as much as possible, and that is our target, that is what we try to do. Uh, and the, how we do that, it is uh, the way how you do that, uh, it is different, it is also depend on your company specific settings, what do you have there, what, what your house size, your building uh, condition, everything else, and how do you apply the system, this washing and cleaning system? That is very important. So, and in cleaning, we cleaning and disinfection is together. We we call it decontamination. What does it mean? That means that with cleaning and washing, we try decontaminate all viruses, bacteria, parasites, and molds which are in the house after the old flock. During the production, it, it comes through together. And then we try now to, to remove all of these and, um, and then uh, allow the new flock a good condition for the next production. That is uh, what we call it decontamination. It starts by removing of old manure or litter. Today is usual. I remember it was 20, 25 years ago. Some, they had the litter for one year. They didn't remove the litter between the flocks. But today, with that kind of production that we have, so that we are not also allowed to use any antibiotics, and uh, uh, we have a high pressure of disease, so we should remove all manure and litter from the house. And it's very good to sweep it later after they remove the litter to get old dust and old fine particles from the house. And then 
uh, also very important, the electric parts, electronic parts, should be uh, cleaned and disinfect by hand, physically, and then cover it because they are not resistant against the water. So, for material, materials, you see dust, soil, organic materials, site dropping, blood, everything else which fall down during the last flood is in the floor. We should, uh, we should bring it out and sweep and we call it dry cleaning at that step. And if we are good, if we can remove big part of dust and these parts, organic material from the house, we almost have done 80% of the job. That means in that step, we can remove 80% of disease agents. And this is very important. After that, we start with the next step, which is washing. Washing with the water is only just with water to remove uh, now dust and the rest, which is in the house. And my own experience is also to use the machines with, uh, which work with a high amount of water, not with high pressure. Because with high pressure, you can chew the dirt back to the, that side, uh, which is actually clean and washed. I have experienced when we, when we go for the placement, uh, and we can see in some corners, especially in the inlets or underneath of the uh, feeders, the rest, rest of dirt, which probably is disinfected, but is not removed, is there. And that is uh, one sign of uh, that, that uh, washing was happened with high pressure uh, machines. And that is um, with the machines with a uh, high amount of water, we get uh, much better, much cleaner the house. And for sure, it is not only the house, the, the wall or the floor should be washed old, old equipment in the house, like drinker lines, feeder lines, and uh, inlets, ventilation should be washed, or heaters, heaters also very important, should be washed and cleaned. Um, is, is experience also, is also recommended from all experts that this, uh, if you soak the house and the equipment before you start to wash, that helps a lot because the washing then is more efficiency and much easier. And you can remove the dirt much easier if you soak it before. And um, most farms, broiler farms at least, and also breeder farms, they have some evaporation system for, for uh, hot summer time, hot climate time. And you can also use that. I saw that some farmer uses that. This is very, very nice. Uh, and then it is very practical tools. And, and uh, the soap uh, procedure should take a few hours at least. Better it that you do that over the night. That means if you have enough time, you soak the house, make it wet, and leave the house for the night. And the day after, you can start to wash, and it happens. It goes very easy, very good. Uh, the other point is to use foam cleaner after the washing, uh, after the first washing. And foam cleaner is because during the uh, flock, all uh, manual, feet, rest, everything in the floor, and it built up a film of uh, fat and proteins. And this film is in the floor, should we break that so that later on when we use any, uh, any uh, detergents or soap, that it can also uh, reach the ground, the surface of the walls, equipments, or surface of the floor. And this is, um, it makes really sense to use the, uh, the foam cleaner before you start to, to take the soap or detergents to clean the house. And for sure, um, we shouldn't forget never the house control room in the front. That's also very important. And also in the front of the house, 
the area which we walk, we go, and then uh, we are in contact with that area. This is also very important to do that. And uh, disinfection, uh, now we washed, we, we cleaned, we washed, now we come to disinfection, the third step actually. And this step kills the rest, the left agents of disease, which causes disease, uh, if we cannot, re if we couldn't remove that uh, through the washing and uh, cleaning in the first step, in the first two steps, and it is very important. And uh, there are a lot of things to do, but before that, you should uh, have a good quality of uh, disinfectants, and you should also know the hardness of your water because different disinfectants work in different efficiency steps. Step with when, uh, when you have hard or not hard water, and you should know that before uh, before you start to do that, and uh, you and also take the correct dilation and application way. How do you bring it that? Because dilation is um, we should not never save money in the dilation and then and, and, uh, take uh, less disinfection as we disinfectant as we need, because it is important that we keep the recommendation of producer. So we can, how can we kill the disease agents like bacteria, viruses? So detergents and soaps, we spoke about it, or sunlight, it is also that can kill, but we can, we don't have in all our places in the house, in the farm, sunlight, or with heat, or steam, flame or steam. I have experience with the breeder house that they had a problem with the mice and they used steam. You can kill a lot of germs with the steam, but it is very expensive and very complicated. It is not so easy to do. Easiest way is to use using disinfectant as the last step to clean, uh, to kill the old uh, germs which are left. Uh, almost all disinfectants are acid and they contain peroxides compounds, and the, the time which they need to affect to kill the agents is at least two hours up to 12 hours. It is mostly is also written instructions which you get uh, from the producer. And then they are mostly uh, mixable with the water. That means you mix it in a certain dilation step. Uh, with the water and bring it with the different methods, as you see in the pictures, with big machine, with, uh, with tractor or with a small sprayer, depending on your house setup. But they are mostly uh, mixable with the water. And how, what is, uh, what is, how, how can I select my disinfectant? Uh, there are so many products on the market. Uh, the most important is that you also follow the instruction of producer. Each producer knows in which concentration and which duration it works best. And this is the best thing is to follow their recommendation because they know their own uh, product. And um, it's also the time. How do you, uh, you should, change from time to time you disinfect them, even when you're happy with that and you see, oh, it works very good. I do, I took the sample and the sam samples were negative, but it makes sense at least once a year to change it to go for another product because with time, with longer time, it could build up kind of resist of the germs for one uh, certain product, uh, product which we don't want it. and. For that, also working together with the veterinarians is also very uh, sensible because they can take the samples, they can comment the samples, the, the, the results, and tell you what do you need to for the next step or what you should change or not. I took here two samples, two examples uh, from my own work here in Germany. Uh, I was in broiler house in that page. I hope you can see at least the pluses, the sign of plus in the second column. 
and I took the samples uh, in six houses from floor, from uh, feet, feeder pans, and also from inside of the drinker lines. And uh, we looked at the total number of the germs. And you can see with the same method, with the same time in the same farm, in six houses are very different results. Especially in house three, I think this is, I can see from here, in house three, it was not good job. And you see here, four times positive, which is much too much. And the next flock will be in uh, trouble with that results. And it's another farm, also six houses. And we see here, I took the sample uh, also from floor and uh, feed pens, not from the water lines. And you see also different houses, different results. That means that the work, the job was not done in each house really perfect uh, as the other house. And that is, that is the consequence reason why you should take the sample after you are finished and you go to the uh, downtime. You see, uh -huh, I have in the house tree a problem with the floor. I didn't do the job so good as is possible, so should repeat it. That is, and uh, we take sometimes the samples of the houses. I personally go very often to a placement. I like to placement, to see the placement, to see the chicken. And then sometimes take the sample and for myself to, to know how was their preparing of the house for the new flock, new chicken. So the last slide is the rules of biosecurity. Biosecurity is, starts with the good personal hygiene. I like it when the, in the farm there is a, a possibility to take shower and then, and then wash the hair, hand, and wash the body. And then uh, it's also very important to limit the number of the visitors. Not everybody can come into the house every time. Uh, you should really, they should have a good reason come in and also um, all the cars or vehicles should park outside of the farm and not drive through the, go into the farm and park close to the house. And um, and each house should have, it it owns goodwill boots at least and overalls. And also you should have in each, in the farm at the beginning when you come in, also in each house have food deep. And most important, is not because of Corona, we did it always. We have done that always, all time, washing and disinfecting the hands before we go into the house and when we come out of the house. There are most important rules of biosecurity, you should take care of it. At the end, what I say always, a good farmer needs good quality chicken, but quality chicken needs also a very good, effective flock management to achieve the genetic potential which is in the chicken. Thank you very much. That's it. Oh, thanks a lot uh, for your speech, Saeed. We have some questions. So the first question we've got is, um, what is most important and where to to take the TVC uh, sample and how to concentrate. How to concentrate when we, okay, uh, the test is done by uh, by the labs, veterinarian labs, but we can take ourselves and they have the special uh, plates, we get it before and we put it on the floor or, or, or surfaces which we want to sample it and we send it to the, uh, to the labs and the labs that they, they they decide uh, which, which, which concentration they should work. But I understand here, uh, watch concentrate is, is still okay. Each concentration of total germ numbers by thousand less is okay. More than by thousand, okay. it is uh, not good. And where to take the samples? Where is the best place in your walls, system? walls, floor, and the feeders? I've, and inlets. Inlets is also the most forgotten part here. Great. So, and then we have another question. What is the best water temperature? 
Uh, best water temperatures with chicken for broiler is uh, 20. And up to, uh, uh, till 25 is good. After 25, yeah, two, two negative effects. One, chicken, they don't like to drink that water so much, so good. We also not too like to drink warm water. And the second, if it is too warm, it makes possible for the gems to survive grow much again. more and then grow population. So you would need acids or something to, or we need also during the block acids or chlor or any disinfectant going yep. through the, the canine. Yeah. That brings us to the next question, how to clean drinking water lines? Our drinking water lines in the service time is, is actually my favorite topic. It's very important that you use some products which is, contains uh, hydrogen peroxide and leave it in the drinker lines at least for 12 hours and then flush the drinker lines so good as possible, so with high, so high pressure as it possible. And then, then after that, you can use acid or any other uh, disinfectant to clean that. But uh, removing biofilm is very important. Okay, thanks a lot. You're very welcome. Thank you. So, <laughs> thanks a lot, Said, for the nice talk. If someone has uh, still questions, we can also later forward the questions to him. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, welcome to the next speaker, to Tore Peterson. Sorry, please on stage. So, yes, hello. Thank you for the invitation. Hi, Christoph. Please, a few words about you and yes, of course. Thank Thanks. you for the invitation. It's uh, a pleasure to be here. Sorry, me, but my English is not so good. I give my best. I hope it's enough. Uh, my name is Thomas Petersen from Eilers Futtermittel, a feed mill in the middle of Germany. We work with uh, feed for pigs and cows and calves, chicken, turkeys, and so on. If you have questions, contact me and we can talk about it. But uh, today we want to talk about uh, chicken and we have here our next thing as a presentation. The topic is uh, what's new in chick rearing. I work in Germany and uh, the last 12 months or the question was what is going on in 2021. We have so much problems, we have so uh, worked hard, we have to add a look to chicken quality, the farmer gets the chicken from the hatchery, we have uh, points we E. coli, cellulitis, limping birds, ascites, growth rate, feed conversion and so on, a few points. And if you talk with the feed mill, with other feed mills, or with hatcheries or slaughterhouses, often we uh, hear or can hear, not chicken, neither feed, neither slaughterhouse, um, is uh, not the reason. But what's the reason? And don't talk about uh, problems, let's talk about solutions. That's an uh, example. E. coli, streptococcus, streptococcus, we don't like it, the chicken too. The hip bones uh, should not see so, we like it on another way. And that's another problem, ascites, uh, we, see, we saw in uh, 2021, so much chicken. And in Germany we say Unterhautvereiterung, I think in, in on English it's uh, cellulitis, uh, another picture comes here or here. It's another problem we have to work on. And ascites with big chicken too. We have a uh, light and so can you see it's uh, ascites. Another thing is coccidia. We have to look into the chicken if it's allowed or the uh, piats make it. And uh, so we can have a look into. Sorry, that's so quickly. But if we have, we have to look onto the litter. And if you see a picture like this, or though it's not so good, we don't like uh, Tinella. And uh, that is one point in 2021 too. Or if we have a uh, look into the chicken and see here, 
the air here, the air in the chicken, it's uh, not so really good. We see Clostridia, maybe. There were enough issues, but what's with the solutions? The last two or three years, we thought about uh, and talk about uh, solutions. We are here with Edcon in the January and in the March, and we have uh, talk about solutions. But is what's with the solutions? Are they work they good or what is? We have uh, heard from Excel Forte and Organic Essig from Edcon. We work with MSBs and Kreuter. Fish soy drink for oregano mix. It's uh, garlic and oregano. We have seen that seed, uh, kein Freestarter, Lactosrin, EBL Putri against Oxidian, Herbalic, and so on. So much solution. But is that all? Or we heard a few words from Sage Nayati, right words, and it's very expensive and important to work after the chicken goes and before the chicken comes. But uh, I write it uh, too on the paper here. Um, we have very proper management. We, we need proper management in the hatchery and in the broiler management, but uh, from the parent stock too, and uh, it is uh, necessary never ever before. And the next year, 2022, it can get even more challenging. It's a picture from the last webinar, but it's uh, actually two. Above all, is the management of the parent stock, house biosecurity, drinker biosecurity, pet set two, the same, vitamins, mineral, calcium, edge storage, biosecurity, hatching eggs from the farm to the hatchery, and so on. And uh, the next step is a hatchery with biosecurity uh, a few minutes later or one hour later, Hatchery ministries talk about hatchery too. And then the final step just is the broiler farm. Here's a picture from the last webinar. They say it's the same, but uh, I think it's important. And let's have a look to the downtime, the cleaning and the disinfection, preheating the floor temperature. The last 12 months, we go down with the floor temperature not 31, 32 degrees, we works with uh, 29, 29.5 or 30 degrees. Litter is uh, important, run the feeding, unhook fruits, uh, feed pans, kind of on the paper, 20 gram per chicken, flushing the water, and we need chicken too. Good chicken, healthy chicken. Why preventation? Roads need safety. I, if I make, uh, I look back to the last 20 years, the chicken in the year 2000, we have uh, in 39 days 2.0 kilogram, and now we make in the year 2022 20, uh, 21, um, we make uh, 2 kilogram, 2.0 kilogram in 32, 33, maybe 31 days. The last years we have uh, in FCR feed conviction from uh, 1.6, now 1.5 or so on. And uh, it is a, a little bit quicker for the chicken. And uh, so the reason is uh, we have to support chicken before a problem occur. And that's from the parent stock to the hatchery to the broiler house with the best management altogether. In the Chicken house, royal house, we uh, collect up the, or take out the chicken paper. This chicken we don't like, we don't want to see it because uh, in, on the inside we can say it's so. But what's to do? What can we work in the farm? We have to work in the parent stock and in the hatchery. And in the farm, we have worked with uh, the product like Sina Seed the last five, six years. So the last five, six years, it's uh, Sina, and now this year we have made Sina seed, and uh, we gave it uh, against Dolly maybe. It contains two components, a microbiologically broken down mustard herb seed, and specially adapted lactic acid bacteria cultures. One solution. And the last 12 months we see it works very good. 
here a few points uh, which are interesting to read. Another product comes from Edcon2. We talked together, Christoph and I, and we talk about uh, garlic and oregano and a few other points. And so we make a test. I have uh, customers which paid money and I, I am going uh, through the chicken and every week and we have a look and uh, we talk about what is to do better, make better. And one product we have tested, I think, the last uh, two, three years. And we worked uh, this year so much with this product, drink for Gerigonomics against Coli and for the uh, uniformity in the chicken uh, flock and so on. We gave it on maybe on day, uh, day zero to three, seven to nine, 17 to 19, or after the first uh, chicken goes out, uh, we call it in Germany Vorgriff. Uh, we gave it to, uh, together with uh, XL Forte and organic acid against uh, Clostridia 2, and it works good. Another problem was uh, the bones. Are the bones, and uh, that picture is uh, better. And uh, the product we works with uh, lactorazine. Maybe the first three days with 1.0 liters per thousand liters, 1,000 liters water. And we have a little uh, timetable, a far plan, and so we can work from day to day with uh, different products. This product works the last 12, 15 months very good. It's the old picture from the last uh, webinar and uh, a few words about lactosine. And that's a picture from a customer. He works with lactosine and uh, made a picture, sent it to me per WhatsApp. But one point is very important. In principle, etheric oil and organic mixed Acids cannot be better or cheaper than medicine. It's my opinion, and pharma says to me too, we need it, uh, we, we uh, know it, but uh, these products can support and be used prophylactically. Drugs do not help to 100%. There may, may be resistances, increased germ pressure, and so on, and lactosine do not help to 100%, but maybe 80, 90, it's better to make uh, to work with it that without it. And if I see such uh, pictures with the farmers, Zina uh, Zit, drink for Gerigana mix, Lactosine, and he works with the products. And we see on the next picture here uh, chicken, maybe 30 days, 32 days. The litter, this very nice litter, nice litter looks like this one here. And that are in Germany drug free chicken in the Third or fourth term, very nice. XL Forte, the organic acid from Atcon, a very good product. A old, we say, far plan or timeable site plan. Um, we can see on the left hand side from day zero to day 42 which products we work with, maybe with vitamins, mineral, and so on. with. Uh, Zinazid, lactosine, acid, or another example is here. That's a nice litter, looks like this one. That's another example. I wrote it with a pencil by hand. We work from day zero to 34 with XL Forte, drink for Giano mix, lactosine. But what is the on the end, what, uh, which product status do we have? Another example, we work with uh, eBay Poultry against uh, Procedia. And the results, can we see maybe now? Yeah, that's uh, from the 26th October this year. On the left-hand side, we have uh, House 1. Right hand side house two. On the left hand side, we have uh, products from the animal doctor, and on the right hand side, we have you see right on the right hand side uh, down, dinat seed, lactosine, efforts, and acid. But we have also MSB and uh, Kräuter, and it works. And what do work? What's the result? You can see it here on the red points uh, 80 grams, 81 grams more. Uh, 
Gewicht, more, more, uh, more chicken, uh, with the product. But you can see here the feed, the house one has uh, 2,860 gram street and the other house has uh, four gram more, it's the same maybe, but 80 gram more chicken. And uh, if you make a, a Rechnung, you can see 80 gram chicken, 1.5 feed conversion, 100 gram feed, 40,000 uh, chicken are 4.8 or 5, 5 tons feed. With 40 euro, it's uh, 1,900, 2,000 uh, euros. And uh, we have just, uh, after the fourth week, we have no drugs. The left hand side, the, the house one has uh, Imeril against uh, Coxidia. We have had it, uh, we have to work from the parent stock over the hatchery and in the farm too, all together. And that's the reason we have, I want not to say so much about the hatchery because we have here a new hatchery in Germany, it's in the building now. I think next year we start uh, with a big uh, barbecue there or with a small barbecue because uh, COVID-19. But uh, after me, a few uh, parts later, with Rai Münzer, who comes and talk about uh, the new hatchery, I think a very uh, important uh, sign and nice to hear from hatchery and the work there. And the reason why we talk about a few things on back, the, uh, the, we make a circle, a quality circle in Germany, and so we make not just two or three uh, parts of presentation. Um, with one or two uh, topics, we have a few presentation here from Andreas uh, Stein, uh, Atcon, and uh, with Litter and Crop Germany, Eilers Futtermittel, Big Dutchman, the Brüterei and uh, Elanco. And so we have a circle of quality which uh, closed and it becomes from the one part to the next part. Our part is uh, feed. We make feed for chicken, especially in bad weather. The chicken really want to have the proper feed. And that's our new feed mill the last two, three years, uh, because with a proper feed, it's uh, nice and dry in the house and the sun shines again. You know it, good litter looks like so, and drug-free chicken, that's it. If you have a question, be so good and uh, give me the question. My name is Thomas Peterson. If you want to contact, we have here our internet address, my phone number to find a way, I'm sure. Thank you, Tore, for the great presentation and the nice talk. So, also for you, we've got uh, some questions from the audience. So, um, are there solutions like, uh, are these solutions like Synacid and Lactorizine, um, are they a liquid or is there a powder form? What is the question? Okay, it's a good question. I don't talk about it. It's the, in liquid form because we gave it over the water and not over the feed. We are, it's important to give it over the uh, water. You can start in, at the moment or not in two or three days and you are quicker. Yeah. Liquid. Oh, great. Thanks for that. And then we have a question for such problems as E. coli, uh, hypodermic uh, proliferation or weight problems. Uh, what do you think is the actual cost to, okay, to if you, eliminate this? Okay, if you if it works against uh, such problems and to at first we have to work, we have to think about the hatchery, the plant stock, and the hatchery. And if you would uh, get good quality, we can talk about the points from set about uh, desinfection and so on. But if we um, works with our products, I think three to five uh, euro cents per Chicken per turn. Recycling. Yeah, okay. Recycling. Perfect. That sounds uh, like a not too expensive one. Yeah, maybe. So maybe it's a solution also for you in the future. Here the same. If you have questions also after that, or if you have later questions, if you resume it, uh, what we have recorded, uh, please uh, send a, a request to us or directly to the presenters. Okay. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you.
So I want to welcome the next guest, um, to, uh, Andreas Stein. Andreas Stein from Eurodona. So welcome, and the stage is yours. Thank you. Christian. So, ladies and gentlemen in the audience, so let us speak about proteins, about proteins for broiler feeding, about the challenges and what's coming up and what do we need, and I try to explain it. But first of all, I really would like to say thanks to our hosts from Atcon and ILAS and Inno for Cons. Just in the beginning with my presentation, I really would like to state you something about our company, Eurodona Rohstoffe GmbH. We belong to the family Dubbledum, and I'm very proud to say that each of the adults in your in family Dubbledum is working in our group of companies. And now we have a holding, and under this umbrella of our holding, we have companies for the food sector, for the pet food sector, and I am here to represent Euroduna Rohstoffe GmbH. This is a company active in the feed industry, supporting the worldwide feed millers, mineral feed producers, and premixes with raw materials and additives for livestock feeding. We are located in Barmstedt, which is close to Hamburg. You can see our turnover and our equivalent of tonnages. And um, worldwide in our group of companies, we have about 50 employees. And more information about Euroduna, you will find under our website. So, I really would like to guide you to the presentation by showing you the structure. First of all, with the first bullet point, I really would like to speak with you about the home messages, about the definitions, about the protein gap. The next bullet point, I really would like to speak with you with one slide about the growth of the world population and the agricultural land. And next, I really would like to show you some examples of the established proteins and livestock feeding. And in the next topic, I want to speak with you about new upcoming proteins, and I will give you some examples out of it. Then I would like to come to the outlook for us and the conclusion. And last but not least, I really would like to show you my, short, my sources and give the acknowledgement to the supporters. So, what do we have as a take-home message? We always eat and drink, and the world, we will do it, all of our um, peoples in the world, they have to do it, and a good mixture as flexitarians, like um, eating vegetable food and meat-based food is the best for our world. This is, in my opinion, one of the most important messages. And the second one, which is there not in the ranking, but only on the second stage, is the courses is changing. When we look to end users and to producers, under different perspective, it is, it is changing. The end users, especially when we look to, to Western end users, they really have more the approach for vegetable and vegetarian foods. This is also in the site of Professor Windisch, which we have learned on a very good presentation from him, a doubled um, transformation to produce food, to produce food, to eat. So, but it is, it is, it is a way of, of our acting in Western, Germ Western Europe. And um, the second stage where courses is changing is located <clears throat> under the perspective of the producers of foodstuffs, because in the last years in, in Europe, the harvests were not so, um, so effective because of a different um, weather reasons. It really was a little bit lamed, and that really resulted into lower available foodstuffs, producing foodstuffs, producing foodstuff and concentrate more on producing foodstuff. It means it's less available for feed production. 
And the third, but also very important take home message is, of course, Corona or COVID-19 is, is not good. We are always confronted in the last year, especially in the last year, as a long COVID effect that we really have limitations in availabilities of raw materials. Um, we have to wait longer for raw materials. The, the raw materials in itself, they are more expensive. The logistic is causing us headaches all over the world. And we, we see that the material which we can work with is shrinking at itself. And also one good new example for the broiler sector is coming from Spain from last Friday from Spanish news of last Friday, and there it really was mentioned that in McDonald's in Spain that they are running out of chicken products. So they link it to um, to Corona, and I really would like to say I see it as the same. So coming to the next slide to speak about the protein gap. What you can see here on this slide is the official definition from our, um, our feed club society, DVT. And they name it that 75% of domestic proteins here in Germany, under German perspectives, are produced in Germany. But on the other hand, it means we need to import 25% of the proteins. So we have no self-sufficiency. We need to import proteins for feed production. And right now you can see on this slide my personal definition of our protein gap, which is created by competition. And where do we have the competition? We have the competition in very interesting industries like sports nutrition, like vegetarian and vegan food production, of course, we have the competitor from, from pet food. They are absorbing also vegetable proteins. And we have the, the competition for proteins from the livestock, from the life science sector, like cosmetics. And I really would like to show you right now some, some samples about it. Starting with sports nutrition. Right now on this slide, you see the development in turnover in million euros for protein products like powders or bars for sports nutrition. And when you look to the years and when you look to the numbers of turnovers, you see that in within this eight years period, okay, 2022 is only a prognosis. Now, but in total, it means it's a double of turnover. So they absorb more proteins in the future. Another sample I really would like to another samples I really would like to show you right now from the food sector is that you can see here minced products, but it is not minced meat. On the left side, you will see a product which is designed by soya. It looks like meat, but it is not meat. On the right side, you can also see a package which contains a um, minced product, but this minced product is also not from meat, it's made from pea protein. So these are numbers of vegetables we miss in our feed production. And the last example I really would like to show you is from, coming from the cosmetic sector. Here you can see a bottle of hair shampoo containing pea protein. So coming to the point to speak about the growth of the world population and the development of the agricultural land. And in this chapter, I only want to show you one self-explaining slide from Professor Windisch. He gave a presentation in May of this year um, in an internal DVT meeting about the necessity of, of animal livestock production in the future. And this, this slide at itself explains um, the world growth 
you can see it with weight bevölkerung it will grow by 50 percent in in the focus of 2050 but also the demand for food is is double that also means we, we need more meat it because it doubles and um, the milk demand is also doubling so it means we need double of livestock animals to produce it but in this case it also means we need the double of the food for their animals on the other side the agricultural land to produce these feed is declining by 30 percent and the best example for it he gave in in the picture with the football field that this football field right now has to nourish three persons and in 2050 it has to nourish five persons so we see a competition for vegetable products like proteins coming from the human sector so here in this chapter i would like to speak with you a little bit about established proteins some examples under my opinion i name it soy um, as a lead protein like soybean meal and and others furthermore of course fish meal it really was a very very great product in in the past but right now it's just low inclusion like like pre-starters but of course established proteins for livestock production we have it in pea protein and potato protein the cereals at itself of course they also contain proteins rapeseed sunflower and ddgs are uh, components for for the livestock production so soya as the lead protein now um, i will not speak hours about about soya but i can i can really tell you that the ultimate guide on soy products explains everything about soya products it was a product a, a book or a guide um, published by by hamlet protein and we as euroduna we present hamlet protein in germany and they explain everything about the different soy products used in animal nutrition now um, if you wouldn't really want to have it please um, send me an email or, or add on an email and we will forward it to, to hamlet protein and by speaking about hamlet protein i will not do it too long i can speak hours about it but really it's not the topic for today but um, when we speak about hamlet protein we are speaking about a product which is processed under and somatically treatment if you have further questions in animal nutrition's part you can also contact us or alfred blanche from from hamlet protein for for broilers so some words about hamlet protein so they produce with their um, enzymatically treatment a very clean anf soya protein um, with a protein content of about 55 to 50, 56 percent and it is um, also good in in the amino, amino acid profile and it is designed to replace soybean meal on the pictures you see some some products especially produced for the broiler and poultry sector by speaking about the anf the anti nutritional factors um, important is the trypsin inhibitor activity and really on the right colon you see the content in milligram per gram now of protein in in our hamlet protein product and what I can say, very easy for explanation, as lower the content is better it is. The same works with the indigestible oligosaccharides in, in our Hamlet protein. You can see it in this column. And furthermore, for the better conglycinin, you see the cologne on the right side from these special designed AV start product from Hamlet protein the beta conglycinin content is very low on the conclusion as lower as better 
But speaking about about soya, not only means not only speaking about hamlet protein. Um, we have soya imported from from overseas, um, soya products. But um, we have also soya cultivation here in Europe. Now, right now, I would show you like to show you some some slides from from Donau Soya, which is an NGO from from Austria. They are located in in Vienna, and they really have under um, their members the soya producers from Europe and and from from Russia, and they claim for themselves that they will grow in the next years with the area of cultivation for for soya by 82 percent. So it means we have also more soya from from Europe available. Right now, they, they claim for themselves that they have under cultivation right now 3% of agricultural land in, in Europe. But right now, they also see that they are in, in, a, in a focus. And here you can see a slide from Donal Zoya about the shares of vegetable proteins cultivated in, in Europe. And you see the different ones, and on the left side, you see it under the focus of, of today. And you see that, that the majority is in cultivation for, for soya. And on the right side, you see a prognosis from Donal Soya about the de development in the next years. And they will see that the cultivation of pea, wheat, and lupines is growing and the soya at itself is is de declining. And I have to say it very honest that this focus is designed for, for food production. But at itself, when there is a production for food, we have to hope that we can get also enough material available out of this production for, for feed. And wheat and pea, as I said before, is also an interesting component in 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 our feed production. So, coming now to to that, what really is, I guess will interest you at most is to speak about new proteins with you. And I will start with the PUPs. It means processed animal proteins. And under this category, you will see one product named or one product group of insect protein. Plasma is, is is a little bit is a little bit out of it because the pups they they are allowed to use in in feed production from from this year onwards and plasma you can use in animal production from 2006 onwards. On the next bullet point, I really would like to give you one example about a um, company named Unibio producing producing a new protein. And the, the, the next bullet, the, the last bullet point on this slide is designed for um, proteins coming from water or underwater. And most of them, they are right now in research. And I will come to it. We need it. We need every protein. I really would like to give one funny example, but when it is funny, it is also very serious. One good friend of mine from the broiler or poultry production, he said to me that he really would like to use as a protein source minced and milled moccasin shoes when they contain protein. So it's a joke, we can laugh about it, but the background is very serious. We need each protein which is available. And of course, he also said he only will use it when it is registered in the positive list and when it has approval from Q&S. So, coming to insect protein, first of all, one legal information from our DVT. They really have claimed that it is allowed right now from September onwards in pig and in poultry feed production. So, here is one slide or two slides will come from company Hermetia here in Germany, and they produce insect protein 
from the black soldier fly. Here is a little bit explanation about the, the fly at itself, but they, they use it from the lobby stadium. And um, in, in this stadium, it contains roughly 40% of protein. And finally, when the protein meal is, is produced, it contains above 60% of, of protein and all essential amino acids. Um, the application is approved by different tests in the university. And um, it is used in fish and for broilers. And the university in Kiel, they say it is also a good replacement material for fish meal at itself. So, statement, nice, we need it. And in, the, in this time, in this current time, they are running trials with pigs in the university in Göttingen and in Berlin with dogs. But in this product at itself, we are not also not alone as the feed industry. So where do they sell as the insect organization their insect protein? They sell it to the pet food sector, to the agriculture sector, and let us look to aquaculture and let us look to broilers, you see that within the next years, they see a big development in the aquacultural sector and we stay stable by 10%. So some words about plasma protein from, from APC. The, the APC plasma protein is um, hemoglobin or hemoglobin um, hydrolysate. It is mainly used in pre-starter and starter diets with two to three percent the three first three to five days. Again, some legal information about processed animal protein above the plasma protein. It is allowed also from September onwards to use it in livestock feeding. But you can see figures right now from, from the DVT here in, in Germany that they really have counted now raw materials for pups with about two, two million tons. But finally, from this two million tons, um, only a small number is available after processing um, for our feed production. And at itself, we have some, some limitations. Not every feed miller can, can use these processed animal proteins. Um, and at itself, the total number had not that influence in, in Germany to increase the number of proteins, because this is stated here also from the DVT. They show a graph um, about the usage of the pups and food grade proteins by destinations, um, where they are used. And um, you really have, have to severe look for terrestrial animal feed. It is red, but the share, it is small for us. So, finally, I really would like to speak with you about the group from, from UniBio. It is a Danish company producing their products, UniProtein, in, in Russia because there is everything available what they need for the production. It is a fermented protein of microbes. And finally, it contains about 70% of crude protein and the usage in the beginning was mainly in, in, in aqua feed. Um, and we as Euroduna, we have right now the allowance to speak it in, to, to sell it in the poultry sector in, in Germany. But if you have any questions from, from other countries, please contact us and we will share it with, with, with Unibio directly. So right now I really would like to come to my outlook and to my conclusion. As I said to you before, I see that the competition for proteins is really getting 
harder. We have not more agricultural land available and more industries trying to, to, to grab the proteins. And I can tell you that the food and the cosmetic sector, they pay more for the proteins than our, our feed sector. And so the focus for the producers seems to be clear. The research on no new proteins is running, as I said to you before, with the based water proteins, and they will come. Until today, to, to, to that these proteins were coming, we need flexibility. We need flexibility because we have to wait for, um, for proteins longer because of limitations of availability or um, logistics, and we have to pay more and we have to be flexible when the new proteins will come that we have to check if we can use it. So here I really would like to show you my sources for the presentation. I really would like to say thanks to all the supporters. And here with, I really would like to close my presentation and thank you in the audience for your time. Thanks, Andreas. Thanks a lot for your interesting talk. And we got some questions. Um, how do you see the acceptance of the protein sources uh, from pigs uh, as a protein carrier in broiler feed? Yes, yeah, interesting question. Um, personally, maybe I'm totally wrong, but um, if we, if, if I have a look to the Germans, they really will not accept it from, from my point of view. They, they will not accept it because they, 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 see, they, they, they see the fear from the end users that, that there is meat inside, and I think they will not accept it. Yeah. Also, a small remark, what, what I could see. Uh, we had some questions that uh, some of the slides was uh, in German. But I already typed into the audience that uh, I think they were not available in English form and you could not uh, wanted to modify them. Yes, because later on we have the German presentation and um, for the German presentation it, it was designed mainly. But um, I, I say sorry for that. If you have any questions about it, please contact Christoph or contact me and, and we will clarify it. Yeah. Please send us an email. Yeah. And then we have another question. Uh, do you see Unibio as a realistic protein carrier uh, or source for broilers? Yes. Yes, I see so. Because um, with, with, with our contact partner in Unibio, he really is, is very strong and eagerly to, to support us with material. Okay. Maybe in the first stage we, we cannot sell it to, to everyone, but um, we have some, some partners in, in, in focus and we try to, to support them within the next time. For my personal, I also have the question, do you see it more in young animals or more in adults or? More in young animals. More for the starter yeah, period. More for the starter period. Starter feed, something like that. In yeah. Okay, thanks a lot. I thank you. So, thanks. Mm -hmm. So, we welcome the next speaker. Just a second. Christian Lickstedt, please, welcome. So, Christian Lickstedt, stage is yours. Thank you. Well, it's nice to be back on this stage. Well, it's our stage in the end. Uh, Atcon is hosting uh, this webinar today. Um, within this year, as you see, uh, the expert webinar 3.0, um, we are already at the third part, which means uh, Part one and two uh, was done earlier this year. And in those two um, sessions, we were mainly concentrating on the use of, let's call it regular acidifiers uh, in uh, poultry production, especially also uh, in broiler. Um, the change of this um, webinar today is that we are looking into the use of the third generation acidifier in broiler production. And what are we mean with that? Well, I will try to clarify within the next 15 or 20 minutes. Speaking of regular acidifier, um, just a short feedback on that one. The antimicrobial effects on acids or, or uh, acid salts against bacteria are mainly directed against gram-negative bacteria, as shown on this slide over here. Um, this concept is really well known 
within uh, several decades, the organic acid, its undissociated form, is able to pass through the cell membrane of a gram-negative bacteria, acidify the bacteria cytoplasma, which is uh, usually at a range of pH 7, and uh, the bacteria would like to restore its normal uh, pH level in the cytoplasma and starts pumping out uh, the additional hydrogen ions from the acid. This leads to an energy loss, and this can also furthermore lead into a disruption of the DNA and protein synthesis, and with that, bacteria is dying in a rather short period of time. This holds true for gram-negative bacteria only. So what about gram-positive bacteria? And there, gram-positive bacteria, as you can see inside the magnification glass, um, they have on top of their cell membrane an additional cell wall. And this cell wall uh, consists out of peptidoglycans, which is not containing any phospholipids, and therefore the undissociated form of the organic acid is not able to uh, attach to it and therefore cannot penetrate it. So does that mean we are... Uh, left at a loss with gram-positive bacteria, or are there ways in order to create an antimicrobial impact? And sure, it is possible. We just need to follow different routes and different ways. And this is where the third-generation acidifier comes into a discussion. Because fighting gram-positive bacteria with these additional cell wall consisting out of peptidoglycans is certainly possible. You just need different substances, different additives in order to do so. And for instance, um, medium chain fatty acids or the uh, um, glycerol esters of medium chain fatty acids are able to do a lysis of the cell wall so they can open that type of brick wall uh, of the cell wall and enable it uh, that regular acidifier can again reach the cell membrane and therefore then create the already proven effect of the acidifier of, for instance, uh, diformates, formic acid, double salts. And this is where ATCON started to create, to develop their own third generation acidifier. And one of them would be Formi3G, consisting out of the concept of sodium diformate as well as um, uh, medium chain uh, fatty acid uh, immunolaurate, for instance. And we have uh, we are very pleased um, that this um, agglomerate of uh, a diformate and the monolurate had been caught the uh, interest of several universities. And here, Nies et al. Uh, just came out a couple of weeks ago uh, from a, a UK uh, university. They studied the minimum inhibitory concentration of different additives and active ingredients, uh, active uh, ingredients in vitro, and among them were also the ingredients used uh, in Formi3G, and they tested uh, the impact um, of the substance versus very um, important poultry pathogens as well as zoonotic agents for humans in order to reduce food poisoning or, or any other issues which, which could, uh, could cause trouble uh, in human health. So there were Staphylococcus, Salmonella, Streptococci uh, involved over there. And you can see the MIC levels really in a range where it makes it uh, interesting for the user uh, at a broiler farm um, to use such substances in order to stop the growth of uh, streptococci or salmonella or, or um, the staphylococci, for instance. Um, so, in the end, the authors commented that there is a strong and broad impact against gram-negative and gram-positive uh, bacteria if you choose the right substances uh, in your product, in your, in your additives. Um, we have been testing this concept uh, already uh, since a couple of years. And uh, it was found that by using those third generation acidifier, we are really able to improve the um, gut health status uh, based here on the Elanco gut health assessment uh, tool. Um, so we were able to prove that by using a uh, third generation acidifier, we had been able to improve uh, that gut health status by quite some uh, figures. Okay. 
Um, we are not left alone with just one R&D stream. However, uh, the road uh, in our third generation acidifier really took us uh, quite, quite far already. Uh, the next one, which just came out um, uh, earlier this year, is a product called Farmy Alpha, which again is based on the trusted um, asset technology with which Adcon patented, uh, the diformate technology, which is a, a main part of this product. However, with partners, with strategic partners, we have added, for instance, Gordino acetic acid, um, which some of you may have heard already about it. We add the medium chain fatty acid, as we found that they have been rather interesting in the Formi 3G concept. And we add another uh, innovative step on our side, the plant acid. So we can really say that Formi Alpha has a broad impact. It brings fourfold broad protection. Do we mean with that? Um, this one uh, is one of the earliest studies we, we have done with it uh, uh, at the end of uh, 2020. And here we looked into the early performance in broiler till uh, day 2021. 20, and since this was done uh, outside Europe, there is still the antibiotic growth promoters as a positive control uh, included. So we were running it against a negative control, the positive control, as well as the Formula Alpha group at 0.2%. Uh, and as you can see, regular performance parameters had been significantly improved, even if compared against an antibiotic. So this seems to be one step um, or one product class which can be used as an antibiotic replacement if used uh, uh, in, in, in proper dosages. Um, we are very proud that we had been able to run this system as well in the US at the uh, Southern uh, Poultry Research Group, uh, an institute uh, in Georgia, um, so in the Southern uh, United States. And this trial was running over the summer and uh, this year, and we were looking into the performance data under a strong bacterial challenge uh, till day 15. Um, here, the positive control was our regular acidifier, so we wanted to see the additional impact Formi Alpha is able to create compared to regular uh, acidifier. And then for sure we had a, an infected control and the infection was really serious because we had necrotic enteritis as well as uh, Salmonella Heidelberg challenge um, starting from day one. Uh, and we were looking into the regular performance data as well as into the mortality. And as you can see, uh, the adjusted uh, feed efficiency parameter as well as uh, mortality was significantly lower, so improved in the Formula Alpha group, for sure, uh, if compared uh, against an infected control, but also compared to the regular acidifier. So we really see here the additional benefits we are able to supply when using a third generation acid. Yeah, mortality significantly reduced by, by 47%. So this is a big achievement if we're talking about that double challenge, necrotic enteritis, as well as Salmonella Heidelberg. Good. Um, as I said, there was a fourfold prote uh, protection coming with uh, Formula Alpha. And to uh, highlight this a bit more, I'm talking now a bit on the uh, inclusion of that Guadino acetic acid, which uh, is known to have an impact against wooden breast. There had been uh, several studies uh, running, which really prove that by using Formi Alpha with that inclusion of uh, the uh, guadino acetic acid, we are able to lower the rate of medium and severe muscle myopathies, and they are causing uh, uh, wooden breast syndrome uh, in broiler, which makes the, the breast shield literally non-usable for, for humans. Um, they're reduced by 44%. And this, in other words, would mean that the share of birds which didn't have the wooden breast uh, symptom at all doubled. So the doubled amount of meat you were able to uh, sell without any issues. Um, Formi Alpha has additional impacts uh, from coming from that Gordino acetic acid in conjunction with the acidifier we supply with that, with that additive. Um, because with that, we are able to improve the digestibility as well as have an energy uh, sparing impact uh, for the uh, muscle buildup. And if you add those things together, 
uh, this will lead to uh, less heat stress. This is certainly uh, a topic already in, in many Asian and Latin American countries, but following the COP26 uh, uh, <laughs> uh, conference in Glasgow with global uh, climate change, we might have more heat waves here in Europe as well. So uh, fighting heat stress may become more and more important uh, in the nearer future. Good. So far, uh, I've touched uh, two different acidifier concepts, the Formi 3G as well as the Formi Alpha third generation acidifier. Um, those were two uh, powdered or crystalline products. Are we able to deliver something like this also in liquid form? Yes, we are. Um, Atconic Salforte had been more or less developed on the similar concept as the Formi Alpha. So it also contains uh, medium chain fatty acids and other um, substances which enable us to reach a broad spectrum uh, acidifier. Um, that this is important uh, shows, for instance, this uh, uh, slide over here from Zimmermann in 1998. This is already quite uh, some years old. Nevertheless, it shows that the occurrence of drinking water is also really present in what we call developed countries. So this is here the US and they have picked out two different areas, uh, Washington State, so on the west coast, as well as Delmarva, which is the east coast. Delmarva means Delaware, Maryland, and, and Virginia. And they really had um, quite a number of farms over there. On, on the upper one, you see 69 farms. On the lower level, uh, 83 farms. And you can clearly see um, the areas which is less densely populated, uh, the west coast, compared to the more densely populated, also based on the on the animal farm sites uh, numbers uh, on the east coast. And you can see that, for instance, um, the average uh, coliforms uh, you find in the uh, on the west coast in the U.S. in farm level is around one, whereas the average coliform level uh, on the east coast is 60 CFU per ml, which is far too high. Nevertheless, uh, we should also uh, put the finger onto our own nose. Um, this is data from, from uh, nearby our factory, so in, in Saxony, Germany, and uh, you can see the coliform level here reaching in that farm 2,420 CFU per ml, whereas uh, we should have not more than, than 100 at all. So we are having 24 times too high coliform counts, which means even in developed countries, uh, the abundance of bacteria in the water can be an issue. Um, just for a reminder again, drinking water guidelines, water should be free of salmonella, free of Campylobacter in 100 mil. It should be free of E. coli in 10 mil. And then you can see the different total uh, CFU count depending on the temperature uh, of the water for sure. If, if the water is warmer, the allowed level should be lower because bacteria can quicker proliferate. So, with an acidifier in there, we are also able to suppress the growth of, of bacteria, and that should be, again, all true for, for gram-negative as well as for gram-positive bacteria, and therefore we think there is need for a next generation of acidifier like the one uh, over here. And one of the um, key features of, of such a product should be the lower surface tension, so that the acidifier is able to enter into the bacteria in a, in a quicker way. Um, this is described in human medicine as surfactant cell adhesion, which allows us to have enhanced bioavailability of the active, active ingredients towards, towards the bacteria. And we have tested this um, in, in a water con decontamination trial, which was done in this way here and in, in an indoor uh, uh, layer production. Um, and we measured the RLU, the relative light units, uh, before and after using uh, the acidifier. And we had been able to prove that within a very short period of time, after three hours only, we had been able to lower the uh, RLU from levels uh, between six and 7,000 units to levels uh, closer to 2,000, which is a 63% uh, 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 reduction in such a very short period of time. So it clearly proves that using such an acidifier is able to hygienize, to decontaminate uh, the water of various uh, bacteria. 
well, and therefore uh, reduces the sig significantly the risk of uh, um, cross infections uh, or poultry of, uh, with, with pathogenic bacteria. Well, and with this, I'm saying thank you for your attention, and I would be able or willing to answer questions. Hi, Christian. Thanks for your talk. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, quicker than expected. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yes, we also got some questions to your presentation, Christian. Yep. Um, can you elaborate a little bit more on the method or use to determine the water decontamination? Ah, right, yeah. Well, uh, I was maybe a bit too quick on that one. Um, relative light units um, measures the ATP uh, in water column, which means we have since every living thing on Earth um, uses uh, as an energy source adenosine three phosphate. So whatever fragment or derivates we, we find on, on ATP in water must come from some living substances, which in the end you don't want to have in the water. It should be free of bacteria, of molds, of algae, of whatsoever. So it's a total microbial load in the water and that should be as low as possible. The only the, the good one is it works very quick. As I said, within three hours you have good data. The slightly hindsight is uh, it delivers you the overall microbial load, so you're not able to specify whether you are, have now uh, some remains of E. coli in there or whether you have remains of salmonella in there. This one you don't know. You know uh, the overall load, which gives a good figure. And if you then still have doubts, you can send it to a lab and they can specify, okay, you have some, some E. coli or whatsoever. Yeah. And then we have a question, uh, what is the legal status of the assets from your side? But I think this is a wide range as we have a lot of guests and I have, cannot see where the guests are from, which are writing that. So I think this is a wide range. But Th this is a wide range. Uh, you, usually it's, it's, it's a premix share. Uh, for us in Germany, it's important because the, this, the last product, which, I, which I've described, uh, would be even rated as a supplementary feed. So the legal status of that is really pretty easy because we were able to to include such a wide range of, of uh, ingredients into the um, into the substances like medium chain fatty acids, uh, the plant acids, etc., which allows us to reconfigure that product from a normal feed additive only into into a sub supplementary feed for instance. But uh, this is specific for for the German market, maybe for the European, but yes, I don't I, so. I don't don't think this this plays any role uh, in Asia for instance. At least as I don't know. Yeah. But thanks for answering the question. Yeah. So, okay. Thanks a lot for yeah. having you here and for your speech. Yep. Yeah. So we will welcome the next speaker. I want to welcome uh Konstantin Seffing from InnoCons. And please the stage is yours. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me. I think it's now the third time. I think you're I'm, one of the guests, which yeah, is always. And I'm very happy being here and uh, be a part of this great uh, web presentation one more time. And well, yeah, today I'd like to uh, talk about um, product innovation uh, of litter for a better air. Um, and at first, I'd like to uh, uh, introduce myself um, for uh, some seconds. So my name is uh, Konstantin Seffing. I'm the executive partner of the InnoforCons company, which is a mid-size uh, family enterprise. We are producing and developing uh, natural fibers for more than uh, 10 years now. And we are in uh, two branches of so the industry. Uh, there we are producing natural fibers and we are producing for animals, for animal care. Um, there we are producing litter for pets, for cows, for horses and uh, poultry. Well, our products for the poultry, which is interesting for today, I think, are the Dinkel pellets, the Dinkel granulat, the Dinkel streu and the Dinkel or premium, which has an, uh, which is a litter who is working on the side of the bacteria, who is reducing the growth of bacteria. And well, 
Uh, at the end of my uh, small presentation, I'd like to talk about entertainment for animals. So um, there we have the product Tudu, and um, we developed a bit on that product. And uh, today I can show you some results of it. Now I'd like to take you on a journey to show you what we are doing, what we are working for, so we are thinking to improve a litter, to think a bit more about the quality of the air in the stable by focusing on the uh, ammonia in the stable. So, and therefore, um, I like to um, get an eye on the origin of the ammonia emission, which is over 70% located in the agriculture sector. There we have the cows with 43% and with the pigs of 19%. The poultry, number three, is with 8%. And um, well, we are thinking what is good and what is bad air to just to get an idea of what we are talking about. and. Here, uh, the German government uh, gave us a limit, a limit for the ammonia, uh, which is by 20 ppm, and for the carbon dioxide of 3,000 ppm. This means not that 19 ppm ammonia is a good air. No, the good air is below than that. So when you're talking about one, two, three, four, it's okay. It's not really good, but it's okay when after that it's rising and it's get worse, worse and worse. 20 is a limit, so 19 is not good, huh? just for understanding. But what is ammonia about and um, is it dangerous for people? Yes, when we have reached the 1,700 ppm, which is quite a lot, yes, of course, uh, we came here to the border of the mortal damage or uh, mortal danger for human beings. Just um, to remember, for the poetry, we, we are talking about the limit here in Germany of about 20 ppm. So the government um, have an eye on the ammonia concentration and they they want to make a significant reduction of the ammonia uh, in the next years. So I think from that point of view, we have to um, find a nice product which helps us to reduce the ammonia. And on the other hand, we have to think about when we have a reduction of the ammonia in the stable, it's good for the animals because there is an direct impact of uh, bad air to the health of the animals. It's, it's affecting the health system like the eyes or even the breathing system. The second thing is it's good for our environment. It's better for our environment. And last but not least, yes, it's better for us, for sure. Well, we want to improve the air in the stable. A good bedding could be an effect on better air in the stable, which is the direct impact on the animals. When we are talking about the air cleaning system, we have an impact on the environment outside the stable. But now we are talking about the litter, which has the closest and direct impact for the animals. We make the small test and uh, we're thinking about what happened in the stable and where is um, the ammonia produced in the stable. There we were focusing, of course, uh, on the litter. And here you can see on this picture, um, this shows an example of loose litter. We all want to have loose litter in the stable. It's good for the house, for the feeds of the animals, of the poultry. So, um, and here you can see the brown floor and the orange points are the litter and the accretations uh, are the red ones. And we have the loose litter and 
According to that, the air can go through the litter, which is very nice to keep it dry and it's loose and everything is fine, has a good effect on the feeds of the animals, but we have a higher level of ammonia in the air. The other thing is that we um, have a fixed litter um, on the top. So there we have not the, um, the, the exudations are, is not able to come out from the bedding. And here we have a lower level of the ammonia in the air. But this is a problem. We want to have loose litter, but loose litter has the effect of bad air. And if we had fixed litter in the stable, we have a ne negative impact on the feeds, for example, um, but we have better air. So here you can see, we have to think, uh, think about what can we do um, in this critical time part during this time zone. After up to 15, 20 days, the ammonia concentration in the air rises up. And exactly to the point where the bedding is getting fixed or harder in the stable, there it drops down the ammonia in the stable. And here it's our job to find a solution how to handle, how to get the ammonia saved, closed, covered in the litter and not getting Time. During the. Oh, now we are back in the game, I think. Ah, just one second. So, the Dinkel's Joy is the most crushed pellet, and then we make the granulate, which um, has the effect that we put some pellets into the litter. And then, after a short period, the Product, ah, we are nearly back in the game. The product can uh, put to refresh it by itself. So we are working on that in the past, but now uh, we are more focused on the air. In the past, we are more focused on the feeds, on the health of the animals. Now we have a new goal to refresh the air. It's okay. I can go on? Go on. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Okay, I'm sorry for that. Um, well, we check different types of bedding. So just uh, to, to um, show you some differences of them. Um, the wood bedding is, has a very good hygiene. And um, the problem here is that we have a low ammonia binding and it's difficult in case of disposal. Um, the straw granulate and the straw pellets, I think everybody knows a bit about that product, um, has a middle nice hygiene and a middle good ammonia binding in the stable. But it's easy to, to dispose of. Huh? Um, our Dinkel granulate is better in the hygiene effect 
Um, but as you have seen in the uh, chart before, it's not that good. It's in the middle of the ammonia binding, and there we are thinking and working on that, that it's getting better, better, better. Um, and it's easy to dispose of. Uh, in the past, I, I told you uh, the difference or why we make the granulate. It is the um, mix of the straw, the straw and the uh, pellets. And um, well, there we were focusing on the feeds, but now we have the new um, goal to improve the air. And therefore we are working on the Dinkelstrahl fresh which uh, should be good in hygiene, good in ammoniac binding, and easy to dispose. Well, I think in 2020, we are um, ready to present this product. Well, um, and at the end, uh, I can uh, present uh, the turtle in the net, which is an um, innovation which is in development of our um, existing product. You can see it on the left side, the turtle which was in um, a long um, spender for, for the chickens. Now we put it for getting a better uh, exception of the animals in the stable into the net and it's easy to handle and you can put um, this net after using easily into the use bedding and it's um, not a problem. It's a kind of bio product, so don't worry, very easy to dispose of. Well, so now I'm at the end of this small presentation. I'm sorry for uh, the one or two uh, seconds of a problem, but uh, I hope you have uh, followed you, you could follow my whole presentation. And um, well, I think we are waiting for our uh, moderator, or even maybe I can do the next the moderator. The moderator, I don't know. So, um, well, I'm finished now, right now. And um, if there are any further questions, you can um, get in contact with me. Uh, with my or are there some yes sir, I was okay. still writing sorry ah no problem so so many thanks Constantine for the great presentation so we have, will have uh, two questions well when will be the product available but I think in the last sentences you said it yeah I, I think it was yeah. before it was answered and uh, is there any risk in using this bedding is a question. Um, when we are talking about the new product, which is in, uh, yeah, which we are creating, which we are uh, develop, um, no, I don't think so. Uh, we are using nothing dangerous. Um, we are working here on products which are on the market, which are tested. So no, there is no danger for the animals. So if we are ready to step into the market with this product, everybody can be 100% sure that it's okay. And okay perfect. Thanks okay. a lot. Thank you so much. Questions. So, now next on stage, uh, Dmitry Radko. Welcome. Thank you. And I want to give the stage to you. Have fun. Thank you for invitation and uh, introduction and uh, pleasure to be here. So my name is Mitch Radko, I'm uh, working as a technical consultant for poultry in uh, Germany, Austria and Switzerland for Elanco and Elanco acquired Loman Animal Health some years ago and today I will tell you some facts or field experience about Gumboro disease. So uh, maybe there are still some German words in the presentation because we do it in bilingual today but anyhow I will go with a uh, high speed through the slides and if you have any questions later please please ask or put in the chat or um, and Christoph will moderate them. So today I will tell you about situation with Gumboro disease of chicken and uh, some um, field experience. Um, we make some overview, uh, I show you some uh, facts from monitoring of Gumboro disease and 
some uh, general remarks to vaccination um, of Gumboro because there are some uh, particular information maybe is uh, of interest. Yeah, you know that uh, infectious uh, bursitis virus, highly contagious, one of the most important immunosuppressive disease for poultry diseases. And the primary target is a bursa, bursa fabrizi, uh, organ which uh, produce B lymphocytes. And um, when you speak about Gumboro, uh, who produce chicken or keep the chicken know it. And in most cases, we hear the word immunosuppression. Because if you, or if the virus uh, attack uh, bursa, the production of lymphocytes is uh, damaged or inactivated or disturbed. And um, immune system cannot uh, produce antibodies or it's um, have impact also on other parameters in production. Yeah, the pathogenesis is, uh, can be shown on this slide. So, you know, everybody who opens the birds or do the necropsy, you know the bursa fabrizi, so the bee from the bursa, the organ, which is very important. So, all birds have it, also singing birds. So, it's interesting to, um, to know that it's a particular organ which is uh, important for the, for the birds and, for, of course, then for poultry producers. So, and after infection uh, happens, um, virus virus persist in in in, in body, and um, you can observe that flocks or birds are more susceptible to secondary infection, like E. coli or Campylobacter, which is commensal bacteria, Coccidia, and also it can have a impact of uh, vaccination success, also from Newcastle or uh, infectious bronchitis. Um, normally, all vaccines you apply in the production. Yes, and you have this different, let's say, negative impact on uh, performance and uh, if the birds is, are infected. So, clinical symptoms are interesting. So, I mean, it's um, for the vets uh, common knowledge. It's appear quite suddenly. So, the flock becomes sick very, very suddenly from one day to another day. Mortality can be low, but with very violent strains up to 100%. Dehydration, diarrhea, and the birds are very really in quiet. They are picking each other. Um, they have diarrhea. And of course, you see also some signs when you um, make necropsy of the birds. So, as I Told before, there are also kind of subclinical symptoms. There are discussion in the field. Some colleagues say uh, there are no subclinical gumboro and just only clinical gumboro. But we see um, the cases when we detect the virus in the flocks, which are not clinically apparent because, okay, they are vaccinated. But you see sometimes maybe kinds of uh, high rejection and slaughterhouse, for example, with uh, dermatitis or some kind of um, coli infections. It can be signs of subclinical symptoms. Of course, you need to make further diagnostics to detect Gumbo. Well, we do uh, these services, uh, sorry, for um, um, our region. And for example, I just uh, preparing this uh, presentation, looked on number of samples we took 2019, or the customer or the farmers took, and we find the very virulent viruses and uh, in 16 from uh, 76. And we find uh, such strains like UK uh, 661 or tabic like And um, and this year also we had some um, very virulent findings. So the Gumboro is present. Okay, you need to look for it. And you need to know when, when time and where to look for it. Um, yes, it's another example of so kind of sequencing analysis. If you find the virus, you can make further investigation to look what strain is exactly uh, in the far on the farm or in the bird. Okay, it takes a bit more time. It's a bit more expensive. Okay, it's for our region. It uh, makes sense sometimes to see what happens in some regions and also maybe understands where it's come from and uh, also provide solution later. Well, um, as I told before, there are two kinds of uh, maybe Gumboro form. It's a acute infection and subclinical infection. 
And early infection happens mostly before third week of age with uh, no real clinical symptoms, but uh, increased susceptibility for other pathogens. And later on, you can see these clinical symptoms I described before. Well, if you're doing the necropsy, you have a um, kind of small tool. You can me measure the booster lesions, and you can also, um, with this tool, find um, or make observation or even indirectly have a suspicious diagnosis that Gumboro um, persists on the farm, or it can help you um, detect or make the diagnosis. Well, there are some pictures from um, done some uh, by me and uh, my colleagues some some time ago of clinical gumbo outbreaks. You see this Busa Fabrici, you see this necrotic hemorrhagic uh, status, and uh, it's very typical. It's uh, it's unvaccinated flock, um, and well, you have the bleedings in the muscles uh, or in the in the leg muscles and you have this uh, bursa uh, which really affected uh, swollen uh, necrotic so um, if you see it once you will uh, remember it and you will detect it and of course you have cases as i said before that you have this subclinical inf infections and it's a bit more difficult to detect comparing with such nice uh, like in the uh, poultry diseases book, described infection. Yes, as I told you uh, and uh, showed before, you have uh, lesions in the bursa, swollen or dematous, um, hemorrhagic and necrotic form. And of course, it uh, varies depending on the strain and situation on the farm on, and vaccination status. Well, you can also see, uh, sorry, uh, moving too fast. Um, swollen bursa is a reaction on in all vaccination birds, but also sometimes you can sw see swollen bursa after vaccination with hot vaccines as a reaction because it's mimic the infection. And also you can um, compare or you can make observation um, if or take the samples to look if there are any field strains there. Well, it's uh, one, one German slide, uh, which I uh, forgot to translate, but the conclusion of this, this is a huge economic impact by Gumboro, and especially, I think it's due to immunosuppression up to 25, 30 cents per bird in broiler production. Well, there are some slides uh, by monitoring. It's um, several tools to make the diagnosis clinical, Postmortem, histopathology, virus isolation, PCR, sequence analysis, ELISA, serology. Um, all available in, um, in laboratories. Um, you can make it pathohistologically and um, see if there are virus negative or infected, uh, sending the bursa and make pathohistology. You can take the bursa on so called FTR cards bring to laboratory and detect the virus and it will show you quite quickly if there are any viruses in the flock and also you can make serology to see vaccination success but also if there are any uh, field infection and you can also take samples with so-called uh, paper stripes which are more easily for animal welfare taking some blood samples at the beginning at the placement looking for level of maternal antibodies. Well, at the end, um, some slides about vaccination and interesting or particular interesting for Gumboro that you have interaction with maternal antibodies. It means that maternal antibodies can inactivate also vaccine if it's not administered on proper time. You have following vaccines on the market and activated live and vector vaccines. Elanco working with live vaccine, and of course we um, um, working with them, and we know that it's a good tool to control the infection, and you need, of course, uh, to know uh, when to vaccinate and which vaccine type is appropriate for the proper farm. The vets know that this so-called breakthrough titer is very important for Gumboro, when the level of maternal antibodies can allow the right vaccination, and you need to 
considers this half time of uh, decrease of antibodies for each bird type. Well, the right vaccine is chosen due to field pressure, level homogeneity of maternal antibodies and genetics, and give you early protection and um, have appropriate breakthrough titer. And if you see this slide, maybe it's a conclusion of this uh, presentation. You can vaccinate too early, you can vaccinate too late, but you have also optimum time of vaccination when you can break through with your vaccine and induce antibodies later on in the production. For this, of course, you need to make the optimal vaccination and estimation of the time, working with the laboratory, getting these findings for broilers or for layers, for example. And um, yes, at the end, it's a short overview of what's going on with Gumboa in the field. And uh, thanks for your virtual attention and maybe for some questions. So, many thanks, Dimitri, for your nice and interesting topic, for the great talk. So, we have uh, some questions. Uh, why is uh, calculation for uh, optimum vaccination important in time of, uh, in terms of Gumbo? Yeah, because we have this particular um, situation with Gumbo that maternal antibodies are very heterogeneous in breeder flocks, and sometimes you have high, depending on vaccination scheme in breeder flocks. So for broiler flocks, it's really a recommendation to take the blood samples from time to time to see the level of maternal antibodies to prevent inactivation by maternal antibodies uh, vaccine inactivation. So it's really it really makes sense uh, from time to time. Okay, thanks. And which is uh, primary target organ for JBD? Yes, I told you before, it's a booster Fabrizio. So uh, if you uh, make a necropsy of uh, losses or of course, it makes sense to look and more exactly on Bursa Fabrice to see it's swollen, there are tampetechial bleeding, and uh, it's a important immuno or the most important immunological organ for, for birds. And of course, in this case, it's a target organ for this virus. So, many thanks for your thank you as well. All. And it uh, was a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much. So, Next speaker is Bud. Welcome and nice to have you here. Thank you. So your presentation is on and the stage is yours. Yeah, thank you. First of all, I want to thank um, Eilers uh, Futter for the invitation. Thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> they asked me to uh, tell something about our new hatchery we are building in, in uh, Bad Benta in Germany. But first, I want to uh, to uh, show something about our history. So my name is uh, Batman Strauss. I'm the owner of this hatchery in Holland, Saasveld. And now we have this uh, European newest hatchery built in Bad Bentheim, Germany. This is my grandfather. He uh, started up the company in 1935. He has his first broiler chicks to grow up. So that's how it started in our company. And um, it's, um, it's a family business. My grandfather started in 1935 with uh, the growing up of the broilers. In 1964, my father, Benny Menstruis, he started with parent stocks in Sarsfeld in the company where we have our hatchery now. And um, in 1978, uh, we started with the uh, hatchery in Sarsfeld, and we started with broiler, broilers to produce broiler dale chicks. And in 1980, we uh, started with uh, grandparent stocks, Tetra and Senna. Tetra was a, a, a laying bird, known as a laying bird, so they changed the name to Senna because it was uh, for broilers. And it was not so confusing because Tetra was more for the laying part and Senna was for the broiler part. In 1990, um, I started in the company. I did my um, my um, agriculture college in Deventer. And um, in 1990, I finished this college. It was an international agriculture college with international agriculture trading. And um, uh, I was always interested in the hatchery. 
little guy always worked in the hatchery. So that was a, a big um, challenge for me to build uh, the hatchery like it's now together with my father. And in 2008, we, we built uh, the capacity to 1.3 uh, million daily chicks a week. And uh, there was in, uh, a lot of demand from Germany for daily chicks. And in six years ago, uh, we looking forward to uh, find a place in uh, Germany, just across the border from our place. We living in the east part of Holland. And, and now it's 15 kilometers or 18 kilometers from our um, hatchery in Holland. We built this new hatchery uh, this year and it's almost finished. In the start of next year, we will start with, uh, with producing in this new hatchery in Bad Bentheim, it's just across the border. And the uh, uh, big motivation was the five, five times D, and I will show you in the next slides. Uh, this is a, a company um, movie. Um, I see uh, it's not going that quick, but this is um, in Sarsfeld. Here uh, you see the tick and take off. You see the grandparents. We have all family business grandparents uh, stock uh, 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 companies, all, all family uh, run. This is one of the um uh, stock company where we take the eggs from uh, they have high gene uh, it's very important they are all uh, uh, really good uh, taking care of the dale chicks and and uh, produce very good hatching eggs here you see the hatching eggs are disinfecting before they go into the, the setters here you see our setter room it's asphalt these are the setters inside. You can see we turn them every time, every one hour, we turn the eggs. And we can all control it with iPad and on the internet, all the alarm system also. Uh, here you can see the um, um, candling of the eggs. We now also have, four years ago, we built um, a machine to candle the eggs um, with heartbeat. So we as you can see, the, the chicken take off, we put them out of the uh, head search, and here we take them off full automatically. We take off 60,000 layer chickens uh, in one hour. And here you see the vaccination. And now you see how they go into the room, full conditioned climate room, before they go into the trucks. Hygiene is a very important issue at uh, our company. We, uh, every day we, uh, we look after it. We have the best results in hygiene. Here the jet six go into the trucks and they go now to the broiler house where they put into the stables. And yeah, we measure them. The right temperature for the Dale chicks is very important. So this is eigentlich the, this is the, the movie from our company in Holland. Uh, yeah, HV Munster, uh, we have more than 60 years of experience, know-how, with our family business run at company. That makes that we have short lines with our customers. Uh, they can phone us uh, every day if there are problems. Uh, we have a good team to uh, go into the field to help them, to grow them to help them with the management. We have a lot of know-how. We work with 28 employees, four truck drivers, four people in the office, and uh, the other people work into the hatchery. Uh, we have our own vaccination program. It's very important for the, um, for the parent stocks. We work on that for, I think, now 10 years, and we have now a very uh, modern and very good vaccination program with the best results into the broiler farms. We have uh, yeah, also the newest hatchery technology like Heartbeat uh, about four years ago. And it's very important for hatchery to keep up with all the new technologies because we want to produce the best Dale chicks and then you need the best equipment. This is our hatchery in Bad Bentheim, Germany, just across the border for us. Uh, 
This is how it looks inside. The yellow parts are the hatches, the red parts the status. This is how we start the building. We have 1.4 of hectares where we built the hatchery on. Show you some pictures. See, that was uh, in the beginning of this year. My father and my son. <laughs> my, uh, this is the where the loading part is. Inside the hatchery, some pictures, insulation. So now you see we're building up the ventilation system. It's almost ready, very important for a hatchery. The whole hatchery is engineered by Pasterform. And we built uh, in this hatchery, we built a smart start uh, hatchers. It means we can feed them with early feeding. It will be very important for the future because of animal health, health and welfare. I think now we have the pictures is outside. Now, yeah, we, um, in future, we can uh, we have a license for 1 million uh, pale chicks a week to produce. Uh, five times D is very important. Parent stock, hatchery, feed, boiler farm, and slaughterhouse all should be in Germany. That was for us all of the big motivation to uh, build this new, brand new hatchery in uh, Bad in Germany. Early feeding is an issue in Holland. I will talk later. Is uh, a duty 2024. The light programs we have in the hatchers, uh, it shows that when you're using light programs, that uh, the day old chickens, they go better to the feed to eat in the hatchers. And you see also they uh, become very quiet. Very, when first time we use these machines, we start with with, uh, with these machines uh, together with partial farm to build and to. Uh, um, uh, to produce and then the first machines we thought that the day old chickens we didn't hear them at all since they all that but <laughs> they, you see they have a very um a good climate and uh, they like to feed and they like the light so it's an improvement uh yeah home hatching we also do extract uh, and and uh, also the animal welfare at highest level in this hatchery is very important this is this early feeding in 2024. It is a duty in Holland that we feed them all. And uh, we choose now for this smart start system. This is a, um, a hatching system with light and feed, what I told you before. And this feed is 30% of water in it. Call it a gel or not. I'll explain more of it in the next sheets. But it's, um, um, yeah, we also now do some uh, trials with um, with nipple systems that they can drink uh, water. It will be important in the future, I think. Yeah, this is this uh, semi moistured uh, the smart start feed. This is semi moistured red colored crumble feed, thirty percent of uh, water content. It uh, contains nanadas, it's a special nutritional gel that prevents the water from evaporation. Uh, based on after egg food, specially developed feed for male chicks, it improves results in the feed using by breeder companies for longer travel distance. And um, we used it feed before in uh, 2003. We had this uh, big uh, problem in Holland with uh, bird influenza, AI, and same problem we have now again. <laughs> But then we uh, we had to store them for uh, for two days and we feed them with this feed and we had a very good uh, experience with that. So that's why we use this feed also now for this uh, early feeding. Yeah. This is how it looks like the smart start feed. This is this gel that's uh, inside the feed build to provide the water. This is uh, the first machine we developed. It was with uh, LED lights uh, between the uh, the egg trolleys. Now we have this machines. Now you see the lights are integrated into the machines. Uh, top the ceiling, you see that the light is integrated. Very uh, easy to clean. It's also very important with biosecurity. You see these boxes on the sides. There is feed in it. You can see it. Uh, this is the light. And we do now. We do a lot of. Um, test the different color of light. We can make the light blue, red, green. Now we look for the best results. 
this is the feed in front of the part star box. Here the egg is closed. Here you can see the how uh, how these are. This is a, um, a movie. Can you start a movie? Just to click one more. Yeah, it's not so. And here you see the um, how they they eat the the, the the feed into the trolleys and the lights uh, sides between it. And yeah, now movie. Yeah, like this. Can you start a movie? One back. Yeah. 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 Yeah, over there. Yeah, uh, now you can see even movie starts now. You see that they like the feed very much. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, this is, um, I didn't have this slide into English, but I will translate. You see that on the right side, uh, piece of logic was first very important. The affability of, uh, there was feed in the world. And, um, and now you see that um, the social security becomes more important. And now at these days, you see that uh, the self-respect and recognition of the consumer is more and more important. So you see that uh, the animal welfare, the uh, health and the taste is, are very important issues for the consumers. And what, uh, what happens then is the attitude of the consumer is changing. In, uh, yeah, in Holland, 55% uh, uh, um, of the people, they don't eat meat anymore in uh, two days or more. Yeah? We have a lot of flexitarians, so the consumer behavior is changing. And um, yeah, we see that um, there's animal welfare associations that are coming and they uh, have, a, yeah, these organizations, you see, they have a lot of influence on the behavior of the consumer. And uh, yeah, the re retailers, they, um, yeah, they, they, uh, they, they, they see the consumer demands, uh, what the demands are changing, and that's how they uh, try to, to make new products for these consumers. And now you see that there's an, um, um, yeah, an, uh, many premium concepts in Euro. These are, are at the moment the concepts that the are available in Europe. And what you see is the certificate for EEC. This is the European Chicken Commitment. And this certification uh, becomes very important because um, um, I will show you the next slide. Also in 2026, uh, this will be the new standard for producing in, uh, chicken or the meat. And a lot of uh, supermarkets, uh, supermarkets, uh, retailers, they commit to this, uh, to this e e ECC. And I will show you in the next slide. Now, the second one, you see this uh, extensive husbandry yeah, with low density. It's a new trend. Uh, the third one, uh, 56 uh, days uh, in free range. You see a lot coming now. You see uh, the the fourth one is is this um, organic will be growing once more, and the eighty one days of uh, free range will come more. Labor rules in, in France, for example. Yeah, these are in um, um, the the uh, compare to comparing into the European uh, marketing conditions. European marketing conditions, you see. Uh, you have the con convenience, uh, you have the, the birds, uh, the yellow birds. Third one is uh, extensive uh, um, uh, farms. Yeah, they come more uh, 65 days of uh, slaughter. Each free range, traditional free range, and the total free range is uh, changing a lot. Total free range is also with organic, you only put. 48, 4,800, excuse me, 48, 4,800 day of chicks in one form is maximum. 
No, how is the market situation in, in Holland? In um, one, the 1st of uh, January 2023, all fresh uh, chicken products in all supermarkets are with one star product. One star means they only can grow 45 grams a day with winter carton, 24 kilos per square meter, eight hours of darkness and enrichment. In Holland, we uh, started with, um, with Albert Heijn and Jumbo, and now all the supermarkets commit to this new system. 2014, you see Albert Heijn, they have this uh, maximum on the left side photo of uh, 38 kilos per square meter, 45 uh, grams of pro, uh, uh, 45 grams, excuse me, of uh, uh, old, and they slaughtered, 50 grams of pro, and they need straw, straws to the stables. Jumbo, they make 30 kilograms, 49 uh, days of grow, 45 uh, grams of uh, grow per day, and also the straw into the stables. Now you see now the other supermarkets in 2025, they all commit to uh, the system of one star. So uh, yeah, it's growing in our uh, supermax in 2023, only will sell this in Holland. Now, the situation in Germany, we have uh, a four-step level of animal farming. Uh, all the big uh, supermarkets using this. Uh, yeah, step one is the, the legal standard bird, 39 kilos per meter. Step two is the ETV, Initiative T-Wall, 35 kilos of square uh, meters. And um, yeah, today already is 95 fresh products. You have the winter garden in step three, 25 kilos per square meter. It's like in Holland with one star. And then if step four, the organic, 21 kilos per square meter, free range, like a two star system in Holland. On the right side, you see this, and you see this Aldi, uh, Lidl, yeah, all these big supermarkets, Rivera, Penny, Edica, they all go into the, this system. The market situation in Belgium, you see this uh, in uh, already the retailers signed early for ECC for 2026, and they all do home hatching. They uh, hatch them at home. It's what they uh, do in 2026. Albert Heijn in Belgium also making the next step into this uh, level. Oh, that was one to pull. These are all uh, for the human chicken commitment. Um, these are all the companies who uh, do with the system. You see Marks and Spencer England, Chicken Fried Chicken, all the retailers, Burger King, uh, Del Hairs in Belgium, they all commit to this uh, European chicken commitment. And uh, yeah, this will be in 2026 that they will do all this uh, produce all for this uh, commitment. Uh, what can I say about the EC? It's uh, 30 kilos. They can produce per square meter. It's a better life standard. And um, the light should be 50 lux. No case. No. And then a controlled uh, atmosphere stunning. In the slaughterhouses, they have to control the stunning. Yeah. Uh, these are all the uh, European initiatives at the moment. Uh, all, uh, this comp um, all this uh, different uh, kind of uh, initiative. You see there are a lot of different uh, systems and yeah, I only want to show them. I don't want to go into details, but you see how many difference there are and how many different systems and levels you can produce for. Oh, yeah. Um, in uh, Germany, they, um, uh, the committed uh, companies like Aldi, Lidl, River, they all um, uh, go to into animal welfare level three and four, as we did before. And in 2026, 20% of more they produce, they will uh, produce like this system, the ECC system. Yeah, this is an... Um, 
um, genetic, uh, increasing genetic performance is not so easy. You see all these different systems, and to uh, generate an, a good birth for this, it takes you at least uh, five years to produce a new, uh, a new line. So, uh, yeah, it's not so easy, but at the moment, um, the, the three leading companies, uh, COP, Ross, and Hubbard, they're producing now for this EEC. And here you see the Hubbard. Hubbard, you have the, on the right corner, you see the red bro. This is a new bird, and they, uh, they grow 50 to 55 grams. And they are now, uh, this line is made for this EEG level. And also we have the Ross company, they make this uh, rustic gold. This is also growing 50 to 54 grams, uh, feather sextable. Yeah, the both parents are slow growing. And you see, uh, yeah, this will be the bird uh, which now in uh, the first years will grow because this is the, the one who uh, will be licensed for this EET. Also the red bull. So I thank you for this uh, attention to my presentation, and I'm not sure if there are any questions. Of course there are. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, thanks a lot, yep. Matt, for this nice presentation and yep. this interesting topic, yep. which a lot of us has, has not on the daily business or on the daily view. Yeah. Um. The, the first question, what I selected is, uh, they're asking about organic. And do you produce organic? Or do you hatch organic uh, broilers or from uh, orga uh, yeah. more organic production? Yeah, we can produce organic, but we don't do that in um, in our hatchery in Saasfeld, Holland, or in, um, in Bavenda. We have a, a small hatchery, we can produce them. But we don't want to mix them with our uh, uh, normal birds we deliver. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so everything is separated. So yeah, perfect. we separate them and then we can deliver. Yeah. Perfectly traceability. Yeah, everything. Yeah. Okay, yeah. perfect. Yeah. And then I'm not sure I understand this question correct. How fast will ECC be produced in the European market? So yeah, I think you have already given yeah. some timeline. Well, yeah. but but what is realistic for you? Yeah. So um, the, the commitment is that they, uh, in 2026. Um, all the companies have to produce for this EEC. But I think you see now that the, the supermarkets uh, and the retailers, they, uh, they're starting next year with, uh, with this production already. Small, but I think, or what I think, but in my opinion, is it will be probably quickly. Because in 2026, it has to be there. But I think in a, in a few years, we will be in 2024, 2025, we already have this. Okay, uh, interesting. Yeah, this production. Hi. We will see what the next is to come. Okay. Thanks a lot, Bart, yeah. for the great presentation and for uh, having you here. Okay. And we will welcome the next speaker. Yeah. Thank yeah. you for your attention. Bye. Thanks a lot. Yep. So, Sven, my last but not least, <laughs> oh, this is your turn. Uh, Thanks and a lot. as uh, also for the others before, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you. Um, good morning, or better, short before lunchtime. Welcome to the last session. Uh, my name is Sven Kuhn, and approximately 15 years ago, I became a mechanical engineer. Um, I'm working for Big Dutchman since um, 2010, uh, and for the last few, uh, five years, I was responsible um, for the European broiler market for the technical issues, and therefore I had a couple of um, different departments at Big Dutchman. And since the beginning of this year, um, I've been in charge for the digital customer experience. And in this session, we are going to talk about the digital transformation of our business and how this transformation will change our behavior. So, uh, first of all, uh, let's assume three, three fundamental points. So, it's hard uh, to predict the future by looking deep into a glass bowl, um, but some things are obvious. So, we all know that 
data is all around us. Um, data is omnipresent everywhere. And also storing a massive amount of data is not an issue anymore. And one part of this solution today is the cloud. Uh, the next point might sound a little bit strange for us Germans, but in many parts of the world, a high data connection um, is uh, given everywhere and no matter of course, um, sometimes it's even better than the power supply or the water supply on the farm. Nevertheless, uh, unlimited connectivity is a, is a big assumption and with the new technologies like 5G uh, and other upcoming um, technologies, um, this will change our digital life. Mm, so the last point, um, does anyone um, knows uh, Moore's law? In very simple words, um, Gordon Moore um, predicted a doubling of the computing power every two years. Um, more or less his prediction held since 1975 and today lots of the computing power is offered um, by different cloud services. Furthermore, so this is also not a personal issue anymore and um, these three points um, are given for the next two slides or for the next slides. So um, all this is growing around us, not only in our business life, it's also in our private um, life. We call it smart, smart industry or smart home and big data and artificial intelligence um, seems to be everywhere. We are talking to our home assistants like um, Alexa or Siri or Hey Google, and we are wearing multiple smart devices, first and foremost, our mobiles. And even our cars become smart and starting to create mobile, network, mobile networks um, on their own. So lots of our personal devices um, became smart. And we expect us, that our business devices growing to be smart more or less the same way. So in the beginning of this year, um, we started our BFN fusion system and all our last versions of Big Dutchman farm and house controllers are already prepared to be part of industry 4.0. And yeah, by introducing BFN fusion, we started our, um, our own industry 4.0 uh, for maybe simple uh, temperature sensors um, up to complex artificial intelligence services um, like weight prediction of broilers without using a uh, bird scale. Okay, and that all sounds maybe a little bit confusing or it sounds nice, but um, uh, what's about us as a farmer? Um, why should we care about all this? And um, maybe this is your feeling right now. Um, but there is a simple answer because it's happening. It's it started already. Um, it's already changing the behaviors of our business, and that's worldwide. So, research expert for digital development really investigate in customers' behavior. And for example, um, yeah, it's pretty easy. Um, we all don't want to wait for something, or we don't, or we want to be efficient, or we want to be updated. And all these issues can be solved a little bit with, with the new tech, digital technologies. So the digital transformation um, will follow us across all our um, business. So um, uh, when you think about um, hardware with uh, the connectivity of um, all hardware to the internet, we um, 
we can get all the data of sensors or of um, feeding systems and and things like that and um, provide this to third parties and um, we create more and more transparency by showing order details or um, following um, the, the shipping status of, of the orders or provide product information, downloads and manuals on our platform. Um, it's also, also people are involved in this process and uh, in the future you will be able to create your, your digital network, um, something maybe you know from, from LinkedIn or all these other social um, platforms and then you can get some digital support or management advisors. And yeah, I will give you one example. Um, if you see here a map, it's from the north of, of Germany. It's just an example. Um, maybe this could be a future information. Um, all these blue dots you can see are partners of, um, of your business and uh, the system um, recognized that all these um, partners are activating their cooling system this morning and you as a customer have not activated your cooling system so you get the information or notification um, that they did it and yeah maybe you want to follow them you follow the network and yeah that's just one simple example how you could prevent your birds um, for hot climate conditions. And yeah, that's one example. Um, and when it comes to support, um, you can use your network to invite consultants or you can participate on uh, online trainings or you can use the spare part finder on our online shop. And this is just an example of a feed pan. And if you need a, a detailed information of the feed pan, maybe you want to, um, want to rebuy the, the cylinder of this product, you can easily click on the spare part finder and then you will come to our spare part system where you have a bill of material, um, where you can find all of the parts from, from the whole product from this feed pan and put it directly into the shopping cart and buy this product and let it send to you um, to replace the maybe the broken cylinder or whatever. So this is, um, this is a, a huge change of how customers work together with us. Uh, in the past, you have to call someone and ask um, for a new cylinder and yeah this is a longer process than easily go into your older um, orders choose your product and find the correct spare part to be sure that you get the right um, spare part yeah then integration um, by using bfn fusion um, you don't have to care about the exchange of data between different um, kind of participants. So um, if you want to share bird uh, weight or silo levels, you could provide it to every partner you'd connect to your network. And the little word um, could might be an important fact because you are the owner of your data. Um, you have to take care of the usage of this information and everything is securely managed um, by yourself. Um, however, there's also something uh, to put into other hands and that's maybe the software part. So updating um, software on a farm or in the cloud will be um, done automatically in the future or could be done automatically in the future. That's also your decision. Uh, and I'm pretty sure um, that there will be a lot of more transformations in the future. So um, to close this presentation, 
I would like to show two more slides to give you a simple overview of a smart um, farm use case and the integration of uh, integration into um, our business value chain. So on the left side, you can see the farms, and on the right side, you can see um, third-party people like feed mills or um, yeah supporters or whatever. And we bring all the information to the cloud, and your network will connect um, the the cloud information to your consultants or whatever. And by, um, by providing your data to the entire value chain of the whole protein process, um, you will keep our poultry business growing. And the goal is to produce high quality food with the lowest possible footprint on our planet. And yeah, that's all from my side right now. Thanks a lot. And yeah. So, my turn. <laughs> Some questions showed up in the room. Thank you a lot for your presentation. Interesting and especially like the nice world you have here. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, how do you get access to your online shop? Yeah. Was someone questioning, so someone was looking in the meantime? Yeah, maybe. Like. Um, that's very easy. You can go to mybigdutchman.com. And if you are a Big Dutchman customer already, you can use your customer number. Yeah. and easily pass the registration process and immediately go into the shop and buy something. If you're not a Big Dutchman customer, actually you have to pass a little registration process and then it's almost done. It looks like you've nearly sold something. If the question here <laughs> yeah. goes up. Um, where do you store the farm data? Uh, yeah, that's, that's a good question. And um, we decided to store all the farm data um, in the cloud and this cloud um, today is a Microsoft Azure cloud um, because they provide one of the most secure cloud solution you can get. So everything is man the security system and everything is managed by Microsoft and we trust in them. And that's really, really important to be sure that everything is well maintained and um, you will get no problems with so the data. datas will have the maximum security data. yeah yeah uh, so the the big four um microsoft um uh, amazon google and alibaba yeah that's their business and security is one of the most important things of their business okay so. nice yeah. very interesting to hear so the last point i want to thank you all to the audience that you here and watching us. And I want to invite all the speakers to be here to say goodbye. Would be nice if you could come in and we can say together a nice and hope we all fit on. So we say bye and thanks for your time. And hope to see you uh, to see you all at our next uh, online webinar again. Thanks again, and bye to the world. Thank you. And take care. Bye. bye. Thank you. Yes. Thank you.